I've been, uh, just for background, been mayor um, nearly 10 years, but I've been local government for about 30 years and uh, come from uh, a mining town of Waihi uh, and have been involved in the mining issue since, uh, since 1989, so, both in consenting uh, area um, as well uh, previous to being mayor. So, uh, that, uh, but look, firstly, I just want to acknowledge, does everyone hear me? My voice is going to run out if I keep it this level. Okay, can I just tone it down a bit? That'll be good. Otherwise, I can see I'm going to struggle before the end of the day. Um, <coughs> is that better? Did I need to start all again? Oh, I'm pleased about that. <laughs> Look, uh, once again, thanks uh, for taking the time out and being here. I will just want to acknowledge uh, Philip Fox, who's made these premises available for us. Uh, thank you for uh, making the, uh, giving these premises and uh, they a few drinks and uh, coffee and that that's here, so thanks to them. Now we have a few people here. Um, I've got some fellow mayors, uh, Neil Botsky. Did I say that right, Neil? They have enough trouble with my name, Treginger, so I always have a, an excuse when I get someone else's wrong, I think. Uh, Tony Cockshaw, welcome, Tony. Uh, Mike Hamill, Mike, welcome. Uh, we have some regional council chairs here. I just want to acknowledge Bruce Gordon. Uh, Fenton Wilson and Andrew Robb. So welcome to you. Have I missed any mayors or chairs? Oh, well, I'm getting off on a good start here, so I'm doing well. Um, with me is, uh, of course, you're going to hear uh, today, uh, of course, is uh, Paul Wiley. Paul Wiley is uh, Chief Executive of Buller District and uh, somewhere in the crowd here, we have Craig Stevenson from Tasman, at the back, he'll be talking. But a special welcome to Kelvin, <laughs> to Kelvin Eglinton. Kelvin's um, come across from Perth, and you're going to hear from him uh, very soon on what they are doing with royalties in Western Australia, as an example of how we could see it uh, here in New Zealand. I dare say I want to start with where local government New Zealand's position is. So local government New Zealand, in developing its its policy and seven strategic issues that we wanted to do as a manifesto uh, that there are copies at the back, the seven strategic issues that we believe we wanted to take up with government. And one of those is creating a vibrant community and economic growth across all New Zealand. We are concerned, as are many of you are in this room, that we've seen uh, some pressure within rural and provincial New Zealand around it, its future, and that's around demographics, employment, and a number of other issues. But on the one hand, we're seeing that's very much where our economic growth and overseas uh, and GDP and export earnings are coming from. Whether we're talking about dairy, whether we're talking about forestry, or tourism, they're coming from provincial and rural New Zealand. And we think there's a bigger issue here around about how we make our communities more resilient and those pressures that, uh, that our rural and provincial councils are, are coming under. And part of that is this one that we want to talk about today on royalties. And there, they, there are the seven strategic issues we're talking about, but a sheer natural approach to addressing regional development um, and growth across all of New Zealand. And one of those we've seen as that some of the royalties that central government is getting should come back from where those royalties originated from. And that's generally the, what happens across most of the Western world, that what we've seen is that at least some of those royalties in some shape or form are going back to the communities. It is a finite resource when we talk to minerals or oil and, and gas. Uh, and where in the past We've been accepted, I speak, as communities to accepting the fact that when we're taking the extractive industries out, uh, it's a boom situation and the communities are doing well. But when they close or the company decides to move on, and there are many reasons for that, they're not just the end of the, uh, end of the mineral, it can be prices, and we've seen that with gold prices and, and a number of mines closing down uh, throughout the world and since gold prices have gone down. And in my case, in my here, it got very close uh, only a year ago to closing. Um, what happens 
is those communities really take a hard hit. And what we're saying here is some of those royalties should be going back to those communities to give some resilience and so that they don't fall over, that there is the opportunity for those communities to continue on. We also acknowledge that for those areas, particularly around oil and gas, where there is some real opportunities. Right now we're looking at Northland and we're looking at, uh, and I'll show you a slide soon, of uh, Northland and again at Gisborne, that where a big operation comes in, there is a need for infrastructure, whether it's roading, and in Gisborne's case, if you talk to Mayor Fink, he's saying there's significant infrastructure we need to put in to improving our roading and bridges, etc. And should the ratepayers of Gisborne pay for that, or should it be some royalties and some part shared, at least, through government by shared royalties. So those are the two. So, um, so that is the manifesto. Um, now, there are also uh, these levies that are also born and that government receives through levies uh, payable to the Crown and the Kori ERLs. Uh, we are really just going to be talking today purely around the royalties part and to give you some idea just the royalty payments alone in the last five years. Uh, royalties from petroleum has been $1.69 million. And from minerals, 49.8, just on 50 million uh, from minerals. Quite a big difference. And I think that we, we have the government, and we are looking at local government, looking working with central government and developing a policy about how the percentage of those should come back to the communities. And we think it'll be different uh, for petroleum as minerals, obviously for, for the sheer numbers that are involved in it. So to give you a bit of a background, uh, very quickly on uh, what, they all, uh, what the numbers are by region, as you can see from that slide, uh, most of it's coming out of the Waikato and West Coast at this stage. And Taranaki, of course, um, is a big number, 381 million uh, for 2000 to June 2013 substantial amount of royalties that government is getting. Uh, there it is in a graph form uh, from minerals and coal. But when we actually click, and if you look at those numbers, uh, when we look at that, those numbers on the left are what we're getting and when we have a look at the royalty payments <coughs> in Taranaki, um, slightly different. So we are acknowledging that the royalties from minerals and the way that will be treated could be quite different from what they would be for oil and gas. And we're going to be talking, we're going to have two people be talking about that and how, how they see it working uh, and, and the effects that it has. Because the effects on the communities are different as well. But I just think we need to point out there is a significant difference. Um, if I put in these ERLs, this other contribution that they get, uh, on top of the royalties, uh, that what comes out, and I think it works out at about $10 million difference uh, for last year between the two overall, including gas and oil and minerals. If we look at this potential, so the grey is the area where there are existing exploration licences right now. The yellow is what's on offer and the potential. So it is quite significant. Uh, the potential for further exploration. And I think that gives it some perspective from what the potential is. So, um, a case for a local share. Uh, extraction is supported by local infrastructure and services workers. Where we see new development, as in Gisborne and Northland, we do think that some of these royalties should be going into that infrastructure. But I did want to make it clear that there has been the alternative argument that local government is just looking for a handout to prop up um, business as usual. And I want to make it clear today that is not the case. What we're talking about for existing communities in the West Coast and in my area is about ensuring that those communities continue on and have some resilience in them and some economic benefits as they move after mining. And if we're going to do that, we need to be investing now. And if I give you an example, in Waihi, it's about 26% of the GDP of that community 
is derived from mining. Now what happens when mining finishes? And it might have been all right last century that you just walked away. I don't believe that's any longer appropriate for a modern society that we need to be looking at that community about how it can move forward. And I want to go back to the last Labour government who set up a $10 million fund. It was actually called the MRI Fund, the Major Regional Initiatives Fund, and that was for getting economic development into the regions. Why he set up a community group, and we have two people here from the community that are going to talk to you uh, a bit later. So what happened there was that community worked together and said, we have been told that mining is going to finish in 2012. What are we going to do to make up that 26% that we're going to lose? So they got a $1.8 million from the government and they put it into a gold discovery centre, a major tourist attraction. At that time, about a $12 million project. Unfortunately, uh, things changed and the economic uh, of the downturn, it was put on a bit of a hole because it was, a, it was, it was a quite a bit of private um, investment and that didn't happen. I can tell you that 1.8 million was committed. It has now been spent. There is a gold discovery centre, about a $5 million project. It'll be a unique discovery centre in Waihi. It'll be, and the fact that it's got the most modern technology, it's interactive, it was designed here in Wellington, and it'll be world class. It'll be holograms, and it's, um, it's, it's quite, quite amazing. That will be open in three weeks' time. And that will go some way into adding on and improving that GDP and making up that, that gap. And that's the sort of thing I think we're looking at uh, with royalties. So I think that's, um, at this stage, is mainly what I wanted to cover of as an introduction of why local government New Zealand has opened this debate up again. I can tell you, um, since we've got involved in this, we are getting pretty good support across the sector uh, for it. But today, I just had, uh, Calvin and I went on to uh, TV3. I must admit it was six, quarter past six this morning. Um, I'm not sure how many people uh, saw it. Was anyone brave enough to get up and watch TV3 at 6.15 this one? No, I wouldn't either. Um, but we did. Um, but, uh, and we had a media interview uh, with media, which some of are here now, um, uh, an hour or so ago, to raise this profile and get this debate on the table. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass over um, to Kevin Eglinton from, uh, from Newmont. Kevin um, is a... Uh, from Western Australia. He, um, he's he been with Newmont a few years. He was he, seven years. Uh, he's public relations for Pacific and Asia. Um, knows uh, New Zealand now because he is actually a, a New Zealand born, born person. Uh, he's in the resource sector, uh, working with local indigenous and national stakeholders, including governments, business contractors, and mining projects in urban, remote, and rural settings. They are key to liberals. Uh, he had a previous life uh, before that as a leadership role in sporting. Uh, I think it might have been in the Bay of Plenty, was it? Yeah. In Northland. And uh, also uh, been involved in local and uh, central government in the past. So, Kelvin, look, thank you for coming across from Perth and joining us today. And uh, can I ask you to uh, join us and give us your uh, take on what's happening over Western Australia? <laughs> 